Life in the Gilded Age, 1865 to 1900. Individual Choices, the Tate Family. Born in China in 1857 and orphaned shortly after in California, the little girl took the name Mary McGlattery when she lived in the orphanage run by the San Francisco Ladies Protection and Relief Society. There, Mary learned English, other school subjects, how to play the piano, and how to be a proper middle-class lady. In 1875, she married Joe Dip. Born in China in 1852, he had emigrated to San Francisco in 1869, learned English, operated a successful business, and Americanized his name to Joseph Tape. The Tapes moved to a house outside Chinatown where their first child, Mamie, was born in 1876. Three more children followed. In 1884, the Tapes tried to enroll Mamie in the school nearest their home, but the San Francisco School Board had long denied admission to all children of Chinese parentage. The Tapes filed a lawsuit to permit Mamie to attend school, and the court ruled in their favor, as did the state Supreme Court. However, the San Francisco school superintendent persuaded the legislature to amend the state law to permit separate, that is, segregated, schools for children of Chinese descent. Mamie was again denied admission to her neighborhood school. See the individual voices feature at the end of this chapter. Mamie and her brother were the first to enroll at the new Chinese school. There, Mamie and her siblings learned Cantonese and other Chinese cultural patterns. In 1895, the tapes moved to Berkeley, where the younger children could attend non-segregated public schools. While still in San Francisco, Mary had become an award-winning and technologically innovative amateur photographer. In Berkeley, Joseph's businesses continued to prosper and the tapes invested in real estate and eventually owned two ranches where Joseph enjoyed hunting. Mary and Joseph Tate provide examples of those whom historians of immigration have called rapid assimilators, those who quickly learn English and to adopt many aspects of the majority lifestyle. Joseph's successful business enterprises permitted them to live in middle-class white neighborhoods. May Nye, a historian who has researched the Tate family, describes them as highly unusual among the immigrants of their time, but as archetypical members of the first Chinese-American middle class. The Tapes' experiences as immigrants, city dwellers, members of the new middle class, and Westerners all involved major areas of change in American life following the Civil War. American cities grew rapidly, and technology made cities ever more exciting places with skyscrapers, self-propelled streetcars, and electric lights. Technology joined with industry to produce new marvels for urban consumers, such as telephones, phonographs, and cameras, like those Mary Tape used to take her award-winning photographs. Historians often call the late 19th century, from the late 1860s through the 1890s, the Gilded Age. After the Gilded Age, A Tale of Today, a novel by Samuel L. Clemens, also known, of course, as Mark Twain, and Charles Dudley Warner, published in 1873. In the novel, the first for either writer, Clemens and Warner satirize the business and politics of their day. Clemens used the pen name Mark Twain as the author of Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and other classics. The name suggests the gleam of a surface gilded with a thin coating of gold that covers a cheap base metal underneath. Among the aspects of late 19th century life that might justify the label gilded were the dramatic expansion of the economy, the spectacular accomplishments of new technologies, the extravagant wealth and great power of the new industrial entrepreneurs, and the rapidly, rapid economic development of the West. Just below that glittering surface, however, lay the grim realities of life for most industrial workers, the crowded and unsanitary tenements of the cities, and discrimination against racial and ethnic minorities. In turning to the courts, the tapes were among the significant numbers of Chinese Americans who sought judicial redress when local or state laws violated their legal and constitutional rights, thereby helping to break down racial segregation and discrimination. The new urban, urban America. Considering the questions, what were the key factors in the transformation of American cities in the late 19th century? And what important new social patterns emerged in urban areas in the late 19th century? During the late 19th century, American cities boomed in size. Chicago doubled to, make, to take second rank behind New York. In just 10 years, Brooklyn grew by more than 40%, St. Louis by nearly 30%, and San Francisco by almost as much. Cities not only added more people, but also expanded upward and outward and became more complex, both socially and economically. The burgeoning cities presented new opportunities for some, especially the middle class. In the new urban environments, some women questioned traditionally defined gender roles, as did gays and lesbians. But as cities grew, so did the population of their most disadvantaged residents. The new face of the city. Many Americans were fascinated by their burgeoning cities. Cities boasted technological innovations that many equated with progress, but the lure of the city stemmed from more than telephones, streetcars, and technological gadgetry. Samuel Lane Loomis in 1887 listed the many activities found in cities. The churches and the schools, the theaters and concerts, the lectures, fairs, ex exhibitions, and galleries, and the mighty streams of human beings that forever flow up and down the thoroughfares. But not every urban vista was so appealing. Some visitors were shocked and repulsed by the poverty, crime, and filth that cluttered the urban landscape. Filled with glamour and destitution, cities grew rapidly. 
Cities with more than 50,000 people grew almost twice as fast as rural areas. The nation had 25 cities that large in 1870. By 1890, just 20 years later, 58 cities, nearly all in the Northeast and the Great Lakes region, had reached that size and held nearly 12 million people. The mechanization of American agriculture meant that farming required fewer workers, so newcomers from America's farmlands contributed to the growth of the cities, along with immigration from outside the United States, especially Europe. The growth of manufacturing went hand in hand with urban expansion. By the late 19th century, the nation had developed a manufacturing belt. This region, which included nearly all the largest cities, as well as the bulk of the nation's manufacturing, may be thought of as, as the nation's urban industrial core. Some of the cities in this region, notably Boston, New York, Baltimore, Buffalo, and St. Louis, had long been among the busiest ports in the nation. New manufacturing also flourished there. Other cities developed as industrial centers from their beginnings. Some cities became known for a particular product, iron and steel in Pittsburgh, like the Pittsburgh Steelers, clothing in New York City, meat packing in Chicago. A few cities, especially New York, stood out as major centers for finance. As the urban industrial population swelled and the urban economy grew more complex, cities expanded upward and outward. In the early 1800s, most cities measured only a few miles across and most residents got around on foot. Historians call such places walking cities. In the late 19th century, many of these walking cities were transformed by the new technologies for construction and transportation. Until the 1880s, construction techniques restrict restricted building height because of the walls carried the structure's full weight. William LeBron, LeBaron, excuse me, Jenny, designed the first skyscraper, 10 stories high, erected in Chicago in 1885. Chicago architects, adapting Jenny's approach by using a steel frame to carry the weight instead of the walls, took the lead in designing other tall buildings. Economical and efficient, skyscrapers created unique city skylines. Just as steel framed buildings allowed cities to grow upward, so too did new transportation technologies lead cities to expand outward. In the 1850s, horses pulled the first streetcars over iron rails laid in city streets. By the 1870s and 1880s, some cities boasted streetcars powered by underground moving cables. Electricity, however, revolutionized urban transit. Frank Sprague designed a streetcar driven by an electric motor that drew power from an overhead wire. He installed his first system in Richmond, Virginia in 1888. Within a dozen years, electric streetcars replaced nearly all horse and cable cars. In the early 1900s, some large cities choked with traffic began to move their streetcars above or below street level, creating elevated trains and subways. These networks of rails connected residential districts to downtown business districts. Middle-class women wearing white gloves and stylish hats rode on streetcars to downtown department stores. Skilled workers took streetcar lines to and from their jobs. Streetcars carried the typists, bookkeepers, and corporate executives who staffed offices in the city center. New construction technologies also launched bridges over rivers that had, become, that had once limited urban growth. When the Brooklyn Bridge was completed in 1883, it was hailed as a new wonder of the world, and other great bridges soon followed. As streetcar lines pushed outward from the city center, cities annexed urban areas, meaning that they took over suburban areas. In 1860, Chicago had occupied 17 square miles. 40 years later, it took in 190 square miles. Boston grew from five square miles to 39, and St. Louis from 14 square miles to 61. Suburban railroad lines began to bring nearby villages within commuting distance of urban centers. Wealthier residents could now afford to leave the city at the end of the workday. By about 1890, 70,000 suburbanites were pouring into Chicago each day, and commuter lines brought more than 100,000 workers daily into New York City just from its northern suburbs. New suburbs, which by the way are defined as residential areas lying outside of the central city, many residents of suburbs work and shop in the central city even though they're living outside of it. New suburbs ranged outward from the city center in order of wealth. Those who could afford to travel the farthest could also afford the most expensive homes. Those too poor to ride the new transportation lines lived in densely populated and deteriorating neighborhoods in the center of the city, or they were clustered around industrial plants. Much of the burgeoning urban middle class lived between the two extremes, far enough from the central business district that many residents rode streetcars downtown to work or to shop. Caught up in headlong growth, cities and their infrastructure developed with minimal planning. Local governments did little to regulate expansion or to create building standards, leaving landowners, developers, and builders to make decisions about land use and construction practices all by themselves. Everywhere, builders and owners sought to construct the most space for the least cost. Such profit calculations rarely left room for amenities like varied designs or open space. Most of the great urban parks that exist today, including Central Park in New York City, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, were established on the outskirts of their cities before the surrounding areas were developed. 
Given the rapid and largely unplanned nature of most urban growth, city governments often have dif difficulty meeting the demands for expanded municipal utilities and services like fire and police protection, schools, sewage disposal, street maintenance, and water supply. Basically, the farther that you build out from the city, the more that you create these suburbs, the more difficult it is to provide these services for people who live way out there. The quality and quantity of the water supply varied greatly from city to city. Some cities spent enormous sums to transport water over long distances, but water quality remained a problem in most locales. As city officials learned that germs cause diseases, some cities introduced filtra filtration and chlorination of their water, but change came slowly. Only 6% of urban residents received filtered water by 1900. Chlorination, by the way, is the treatment of water with the chemical chlorine to kill germs. City residents faced major obstacles in disposing of sewage, cleaning streets, especially given the ever-present horses, and removing garbage. Not all cities had sewer lines, and those that did usually dumped untreated sewage into a nearby body of water. Gross. The disgusted mayor of Cleveland in 1881 called the Cuyahoga River an open sewer through the center of the city. Similar situations existed in most large cities. Few city streets were paved, so most became mud holes in the rain, threw up dust clouds in dry weather, and froze into deep ruts in the winter. Chicago in 1890 included 2,048 miles of streets, but only 629 miles of those were paved, typically paved with wooden blocks. Only in the late 19th century did cities begin using asphalt paving. Street cleaning was often minimal, clearing garbage from a street in the, in the 1890s when Chicagoan discovered pavement under 18 inches of trash. City utilities, including gas, public transit, sometimes water, and later electricity and phone service, were typically provided by private companies operating under franchises from the city. A franchise, by the way, is government authorization allowing a company to provide a public service in a certain area. Entrepreneurs eagerly competed for such franchises, sometimes bribing city officials to secure them. As a result, new residential areas sometimes had gas lines before sewers and streetcars before paved streets. Despite such growing pains, most city utilities and services improved between 1870 and 1900. New York City created the first uniformed police force in 1845 and other cities followed. By 1871, major cities had switched from volunteer fire companies to paid professional firefighters. The new system proved inadequate, however, in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which devastated three square miles, including much of the downtown, killed more than 250 people, and left 18,000 people homeless. Such disasters spurred efforts to improve fire protection by better training and equipping firefighters and by regulating construction so that buildings were more fire resistant. By 1900, most American cities had impressive firefighting forces. Chicago had more firefighters and fire engines than London, a city three times its size. However, stay tuned for the fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in the 1900s. The new urban middle class. The Gilded Age brought significant changes to the lives of many middle-class Americans, especially those in the army of accountants, lawyers, secretaries, agents, and managers who staffed developing corporate headquarters and professional offices in the rising central business districts. Streetcar lines allowed this growing middle class to live in expanding suburbs distinct from both the neighborhoods of the industrial working class and the enclaves of the wealthy. Single-family homes set amid carefully tended lawns were common in many new middle-class neighborhoods or suburbs in the late 19th century. Such developments accelerated the tendency of American urban and suburban areas to sprawl out for miles. Owning property had long been central to the American dream. In the late 19th century, the single family house became the realization of that dream for many middle class families. Members of the middle class found it especially attracted to, attractive to acquire a house in a suburb with streetcar or commuter rail connections to the city. Such suburbs allowed the urban middle class to avoid the congestion of the slums, the violence of labor conflicts, and the higher property taxes that funded city governments. In new middle-class neighborhoods, many families employed a domestic servant to assist with household chores, and middle-class women often participated in social organizations outside of the home. Unlike many working-class families, middle-class parents rarely expected their children to contribute to the family's finances, meaning that middle-class kids don't have to work, whereas working-class kids do. Middle-class families provided the major market for an expansion of daily newspapers, which began to include sections designed to appeal to women, household hints, fashion advice, and news of women's organizations, along with sports sections aimed at men and comics for the children. Such families were also likely to subscribe to magazines such as the Ladies Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post. Much of the advertising in these publications was aimed at the middle class, fostering what historians have called a consumer culture among middle class women who became responsible for nearly all of their families' shopping. Consumer culture, by the way, is when a consumer buys products for personal use, a consumer culture emphasizes the values and attitudes that derive from the participants' roles as consumers. Middle class parents' concern for their children's education combined with other factors to bring important changes to American education. 
Between 1870 and 1890, most Northern and Western states and territories established school attendance laws requiring children between certain ages, usually eight to 14, to attend school for a minimum number of weeks each year, typically 12 to 16 weeks. A bigger change came at the secondary level. There were fewer than 800 high schools in the entire nation in 1878, but 5,500 by 1898. The proportion of high school graduates in the population tripled. By 1890, four-year public high schools were to be found in urban areas everywhere except for the South. The new high school curriculum included science, civics, business, and home economics, as well as skills needed by industry, such as drafting, woodworking, and the mechanical trades. From 1870 onward, women outnumbered men among high school graduates, and I'm going to read that sentence one more time because that surprises students a lot of the time. From 1870 onward, women outnumbered men among high school graduates. High schools, however, remained largely an urban middle class phenomenon. In rural areas, few students cont continued beyond the eighth grade, and many urban working class youth started working full time at about the same age. College enrollments also grew, especially the state universities created under the Land Grant College Act of 1862, but college students came disproportionately from middle and upper class urban families. The college curriculum changed dramatically from a few courses required of all students like Latin, Greek, mathematics, rhetoric, and religion to a system which, in which students focused on a major and took additional electives. Land grant universities all provided instruction in engineering and agriculture and other new college subjects included economics, political science, modern languages, laboratory sciences, business administration, and teacher preparation. In 1870, most colleges curricula still resembled those of a century before. By 1900, curricula looked much like those today, meaning that in the last 120 years, education has changed little. Far fewer women than men marched in college graduation processions. Only one college graduate in seven was a woman in 1890, and this improved only to one in four by 1900. In 1879, fewer than half of the nation's colleges even admitted women, although most public universities did so. 20 years later, so by, eight, by about 1900, four-fifths of all colleges, universities, and professional schools did enroll women. Nonetheless, some colleges remained all-male enclaves, especially prestigious private institutions such as Harvard and Yale. Colleges exclusively for women began to appear after the Civil War, partly because so many colleges refused to admit women and partly owing to the notion that men and women should occupy, quote, separate spheres. Such institutions also provided opportunities for women as faculty members and as administrators. The initial faculty of Vassar College, chartered in 1861, consisted of eight men and 22 women, including Maria Mitchell, a leading astronomer and the first female member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Redefining gender roles. Greater educational opportunities for women marked one part of a major reconstruction of gender roles. Throughout the 19th century, most Americans defined women's roles as those of wife and mother, responsible for the family's moral, spiritual, and physical well-being. This emphasis on domesticity also encouraged women to become involved in church and school affairs. Domesticity, by the way, is the notion common throughout much of the 19th century that women should focus on the home, nurture of children, church, and school. Business and politics, however, with their competition and potential for corruption, were thought to endanger women's responsibilities as their family's spiritual guardians. Domesticity, some argued, required women to occupy a so-called separate sphere immune from such dangers. Separate spheres, by the way, is defined as the notion that men should engage in the public sphere of business and politics, but women should limit themselves to the private domestic sphere. Some women and men challenged this idea in the late 19th century. Widely touted from the pulpits and churches and the journals of the day, the concepts of domesticity and separate spheres applied mostly to white middle and upper class women in towns and cities. Farm women and working class women, including most women of color, witnessed too much of the world to fit easily into the patterns of dainty innocence prescribed by advocates of separate spheres, meaning that domesticity and separate spheres, it's really a, a middle and upper class white woman, white woman thing, excuse me, um, for working classes and lower classes, um, and, and including also most women of color, those ideas aren't really going to affect their lives as much. Increasing numbers of people began to question the concepts of domesticity and especially separate spheres in the late 19th century. One challenge came through education. As more and more women finished college, some entered the professions. By 1900, teaching had become uh, to be dominated by women, and some women were succeeding as journalists, authors, and artists. As early as 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman to complete medical school, and she helped to open a medical school for women in 1868. By the 1880s, some 2,500 women held medical degrees. After 1900, however, new admission practices sharply reduced the number of female medical students. In 1869, Arabella Mansfield became the first woman admitted to practice law, but only 60 women practiced law nationwide 10 years later. In 
Most law schools refused to admit women until the 1890s. Other professions also yielded, sometimes very slowly, to women seeking admission. Professional careers attracted a few women, but many, many middle and upper class women in towns and cities became involved in other women's activities, especially women's clubs, which claimed 100,000 members nationwide by the 1890s. Some clubs often began within the separate women's sphere of, as forums for discussing literature or art, but they sometimes led women into reform activities in the public sphere. Of course, women had public, publicly participated in reform movements before, especially in the movement to abolish slavery. Ida Wells Barnett, a crusader for Black civil rights, actively promoted the development of Black women's clubs. Women who regarded alcohol as the chief reason for men's neglect and abuse of their families organized the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, in 1874. Definitely know the WCTU. Apish loves to ask about the WCTU. WCTU members committed themselves to total abstinence from all alcohol and sought to protect the home and family by converting others to abstinence and promoting the legal prohibition of alcohol. The organization typically operated through Protestant churches, especially the Methodists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists. Frances Willard was the driving force in the organization from 1879 until her death in 1898. Her motto was do everything, and she was untiring in her work for temperance. In the early 1890s, the WCTU claimed 150,000 members, making it the largest women's organization in the nation. For Willard, as for many of its members, the organization rested squarely on the ideals of domesticity. She once offered a simple statement of purpose for the WCTU to make the whole world homelike. So she's expanding the idea of domesticity in separate spheres, saying that a woman should take care of everything that could affect her home, including, of course, consumption of alcohol. Women's church organizations, clubs, and reform societies all provided experience in working together toward a common cause and sometimes in seeking changes in public policy. Through them, women cultivated leadership skills. These experiences and contacts contributed to the growing effectiveness of women's efforts to establish their right to vote. In 1882, the WCTU endorsed women's suffrage, the first support from that, for that cause from a major women's organization other than those formed specifically to advocate for women's suffrage. Thus, domesticity, the guiding principles of the WCTU, led its members to actually challenge the notion of separate spheres. Just as women's generals were undergoing reconstruction in the late 19th century, so too were those of men. In the early 19th century, manliness was defined largely in terms of character, which included courage, honor, independence, duty, and loyalty, including loyalty to a political party, along with providing a good home for a family. With the growth of the urban industrial society, fewer men were self-employed and thus no longer independent, and fewer men had opportunities to demonstrate courage or boldness. The rise of big city political organizations dominated by saloon keepers and working class immigrants caused some middle and upper class men, uh, males to question older notions of party loyalty too. In response, some middle class men turned to activities that emphasized male bonding or masculinity. Fraternal organizations modeled on the Masons multiplied in the late 19th century, providing a ritualistic affirmation of traditional values and modest insurance benefits for widows and orphans. Professional athletics, especially baseball and boxing, began to attract male spectators of all classes. The Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, spread rapidly in American cities after the Civil War, emphasizing Christian values, physical fitness, and service. Wilderness camping and hunting, once necessities for many Americans, now became a middle and upper class sport, a demonstration of masculinity. Theodore Roosevelt claimed that hunting big game promoted the manly virtues of nerve control and cool headedness. Emergence of a gay and lesbian subculture. Urbanization and economic change contributed to the social redefinition of gender roles for middle class women and men, but a quite different redefinition occurred at the same time as burgeoning cities provided a setting for the development of gay and lesbian subcultures. Homosexual behavior was illegal everywhere. At the same time, however, men and women engaged in a wide variety of socially acceptable same-sex relationships. The concept of separate spheres and the tendency for most schools and workplaces to be segregated by sex meant that many men and women spent much of their time with others of their own sex. Same-sex relationships may not have involved physical contact, although kisses and hugs and sleeping in the same bed were common expressions of affection among young women. Participants did not consider themselves to be committing what the laws called an unnatural act and most married partners of the opposite sex. Same-sex relationships that involved genital contact violated the law and the expectations of society. In rural communities where most people knew one another, people physically attracted to those of their own sex either suppressed those desires or exercised them discreetly, meaning that they did it in secret, but the record of convictions for sodomy indicates that some failed to do so, 
A few men and somewhat more women changed their dress and behavior and passed for a member of the other sex. Some even married someone of their own sex. The burgeoning cities of the late 19th century permitted an anonymity not possible in rural societies. Basically, you can go to the city and nobody knows who you are, so you have the opportunity to redefine yourself and to sort of be more anonymous. Homosexuals and lesbians gravitated toward the cities and began to create distinctive subcultures. By the 1890s, one researcher reported that perverts of both sexes maintained a sort of social setup in New York City, had their places of meeting, and the advantage of police protection. Reports of homosexual meeting places, clubs, restaurants, steam baths, parks, and streets also issued from Boston, Chicago, New Orleans, St. Louis, and San Francisco. Although most participants in these subcultures were secretive, some flaunted their sexuality. In the 1880s, physicians began to study members of these emerging subcultures and created medical names for them, including homosexual, lesbian, invert, and pervert. Earlier, law and religion had defined particular actions as illegal or immoral. The new clinical definitions emphasized not the actions, but instead the person taking the actions. This is really important to note. As medical and legal definitions shifted from actions to persons, the nature of same-sex relationships also changed. Once acceptable behavior, including expressions of affection between heterosexuals of the same sex, became less common as many individuals tried to avoid any suggestion that they were anything but heterosexual. I'm going to go back now and read a special feature on page 443. We've got a photograph there with a really important photographer's name attached. This photograph from Jacob Reese's book, How the Other Half Lives, shows an interior court on the lower east side of New York City open to the sky above. As the photograph suggests, such places were often the playgrounds for children of the poor residents. On the far right is a water pump, probably the source of water for the residents. Adding such powerful visual images, possible because of the new printing technologies, greatly increased the effectiveness of Rees's book in mobilizing reform. Definitely know Jacob Rees. His last name is R-I-I-S. And the special feature on page 444, it matters today, urban building codes. 19th century cities grew with little regulation or planning. As Jacob Rees revealed, housing was often poorly constructed with little attention paid to health or safety. Reese's book led to new regulations for tenement buildings, notably a requirement that rooms must have a window. A later regulation required that the window open to the outside to provide fresh air for the inhabitants. Devastating fires, such as the Chicago Fire of 1871, led to regulations intended to prevent or restrict fire. Today, cities typically have highly detailed building codes intended to protect the health and safety of those who live and work in buildings, to prevent or restrict fires, and to prevent overcrowding. In addition, the International Code Council, a non-governmental nonprofit body, develops model building codes that are often adopted by cities and other governmental bodies. If you want, you can consider these two things. First, building codes can spark local political controversies. Use the internet to find recent examples of controversies over building codes. What are the issues and do they reflect the origins of building codes? And second, use the internet to investigate the International Code Council. Who belongs to it? What authority does it have? And is it related to the origins of building codes? How the Other Half Lives. In 1890, Jacob Rees shocked many Americans with the revelations in How the Other Half Lives. Of New York City's million and a half inhabitants, Rees claimed half a million had begged for food at some time over the preceding eight years. So one in three residents has begged for, city, or begged for excuse me, food in the last eight years. Of these, more than half were unemployed, but only 6% were physically unable to work. Most of Rees's book described the appalling conditions of tenements, home, he claimed, to three quarters of the city's population. Tenements, by the way, are multifamily apartment buildings, often unsafe, unsanitary, and overcrowded. They're sort of like super crowded apartment buildings. Strictly speaking, a tenement is a building occupied by three or more families, but the term came to imply overcrowded and poorly maintained housing that was hazardous to the health and safety of its res residents. Rees described the typical cramped New York tenement of his day, a brick building from four to six stories high on the street, frequently with a store on the first floor. Four families occupy each floor, and a set of rooms consists of one or two dark closets used as bedrooms, with a living room 12 feet by 10. The staircase is too often a dark well in the center of the house. No direct through ventilation is possible. Such buildings, Reese insisted, are the hotbeds of the epidemics that carry death to the rich and poor alike, the nurseries of pauperism and crime that fill our jails and police courts. Above all, they touch the family life with deadly moral contagion. He especially deplored the harmful influence of poverty and miserable housing conditions on children and families. Crowded conditions in working class sections of large cities developed in part because so many of the poor needed to live within walking distance of sources of employment for various family members. Basically, they've got to live by where they work because they can't afford transportation. By dividing buildings into small rental units, landlords packed in more tenant, tenants excuse me, and collected more rent. 
To pay the rent, many tenants took in lodgers. Such practices produced shockingly high population densities in lower income urban neighborhoods. No other city was as densely populated as New York, but nearly all urban working class neighborhoods were crowded. Most Chicago stockyard workers, for example, lived in small row houses near the slaughterhouses. Although some owned their homes, a survey in 1911 revealed that three quarters of the houses were subdivided into two or more living units, typically of four rooms each, and that a small shanty often sat in the backyard. More than half of all families took in lodgers, and lodgers who worked different shifts at the stockyards sometimes took turns sleeping in the same bed. Few agreed on the causes of urban poverty, still fewer on its cure. Rees divided the blame among greedy landlords, corrupt officials, and the poor themselves. In Progress and Poverty, Henry George, a San Francisco journalist, pointed to the ever-increasing value of urban real estate, which made it difficult or impossible for many to afford a home of their own. In contrast, the Charity Organization Society, COS, with chapters in 100 cities by 1895, claimed that in most cases, individual character defects produced poverty and that assistance for such people only rewarded immorality or laziness. Kind of sounds a little bit like social Darwinism to me. The COS insisted that assistance should be given only after careful investigation and only until the person secured work. COS officials also required recipients of aid to be moral, thrifty, and hardworking. New South Old Problems. Considering the questions, what new social patterns appeared in the South after Reconstruction, and how did Southern racial relations develop after Reconstruction? The South experienced less urban growth than the Northeast. Some Southerners worked to promote a new South based on a more diverse economy with more manufacturing and less reliance on staple agricultural crops, see the last chapter. They and their neighbors, white and black alike, grappled too with the legacy of slavery, civil war, Reconstruction, and poverty. In the end, white Southerners created a racially segregated social structure that persisted with little change for more than a half century. Social patterns in the New South. Of the nation's 25 largest cities in 1890, only New Orleans was located in the South and no other Southern city came close to its 242,000 people. Atlanta, which prided itself as the center of the New South and had nearly doubled in size between 1880 and 1890, counted nearly 81,000 people in 1890, but it ranked only 41st among the nation's cities by size. Birmingham, center of the developing southern iron and steel industry, grew by 10 times between 1880 and 1900, but it ranked only 100th in the, in the nation in size as late as 1900. Thus, while an urban middle class did develop and grow in the south, it was significantly smaller than its counterpart in the north, and it was sharply divided by the lines of race. Education lagged throughout much of the South, especially in rural areas. Compared to the rest of the nation, fewer children attended school in the South, where the school term was often just a few months and school facilities were often inadequate. Few Southern states had compulsory school attendance laws, meaning they didn't make their children go to school. Southerners were slow to create public high schools. As late as 1903, the entire state of Georgia had only four four-year public high schools. Instead, most public schools stopped at the eighth grade and private academies educated the children of the wealthy. Some industries of the New South, especially textiles and cigarettes, were actually built on child labor, so many children worked instead of attending school. 70% of Southern cotton mill workers were younger than 21, and many were under 14. Mostly girls, they worked 70-hour weeks and earned 10 to 20 cents a day. Not surprisingly, as late as 1900, 10% of the Southern white population was illiterate, compared with fewer than 4% elsewhere in the country. Illiteracy among African Americans was significantly higher. 35% in the South and 19% elsewhere. Despite repeated backing for the idea of a new South by some Southern leaders, and despite the growth of some industry in the South, the late 19th century was also the time when the myths of the old South and the lost cause reached deeply into white Southern life. To define those real fast, because those are really important, Old South is a term for a romanticized view of the pre-Civil War South as a place of gentility and gallantry. And Lost Cause is the term for a romanticized view of the Confederate struggle in the Civil War as a noble but doomed effort to preserve a certain way of life. Popular fiction and song, North and South, romanticized the pre-Civil War Old South as a place of gentility and gallantry where kindly plantation owners cared for loyal slaves. The Lost Cause myth portrayed the Confederacy as a heroic, even noble, effort to retain the life and values of the Old South. Leading Southerners, especially Democratic Party leaders, promoted the myth. Hundreds of statues of Confederate soldiers appeared on courthouse lawns, and gala commemorative events and organizations reflected devotion to the myth among many white Southerners. One of the few dissenting voices was that of Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. The Second Mississippi Plan and the Atlanta Compromise. 
Although Reconstruction ended in 1877, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 should have protected African Americans against discrimination in public places. However, some state laws required se racial separation. For example, most states prohibited racial intermarriage. Throughout the South and in some places outside the South, state or local laws or local practice had produced racially separate school systems, churches, hospitals, cemeteries, and other voluntary organizations. Segregation in the South was driven by local custom and the ever-present threat of violence against any African American who dared to challenge it. Restrictions on Black political participation were also extra-legal and forced through coercion or intimidation. Extra-legal just meaning that it happens outside of the legal system. In the civil rights cases of 1883, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was unconstitutional. The court said that the equal protection promised by the 14th Amendment applied only to state governments, not to individuals or companies. Although state governments were obligated to treat all citizens as equal before the law, private businesses did not need to do the same. Southern lawmakers soon began to require businesses to practice segregation. In 1887, the Florida legislature ordered separate accommodations on railroad trains. Mississippi passed a similar law the next year, and other southern states soon followed, so it's states who are doing this. It's not necessarily individual businesses who have the option to make this choice, but rather it's state legislatures who are requiring her mandating segregation in many cases. Mississippi whites took a more brazen step in 1890, holding a state constitutional convention to eliminate African Americans' participation in politics. The new provisions did not mention the word race. Instead, they imposed a poll tax, a literacy test, and other requirements for voting. Everyone understood that these measures were designed to disenfranchise Black voters. Disenfranchise, by the way, means to take away the right to vote. Men who failed the literacy test could vote if they, uh, if they could understand a section of the state constitution or law when a local white official read it to them. The typical result was that only liter illiterates who, excuse me, was that the only illiterate people who could vote were white. Most of the South watched this so-called second Mississippi plan unfold with great interest. To say that maybe a little bit more simply, the second Mississippi plan included these deliberate measures that were meant to disenfranchise or to take the right to vote away from black males. In 1895, a black educator signaled his apparent willingness to accept disenfranchisement and segregation, at least for the moment. Born into slavery in 1856, Booker T. Washington worked as a janitor while studying at Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Virginia, a school that combined preparation for elementary school teaching with vocational education in agriculture and industrial work. Washington then taught at Hampton. In 1881, the Alabama legislature authorized a black normal school at Tuskegee. A normal school, by the way, is a two-year school for training teachers for grades one through eight. Washington became its principal, and he made Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute into a leading Black educational institution. In 1895, Atlanta hosted the Cotton States and International Exposition. The exposition directors invited Washington to speak, hoping he could reach out to Southern whites, Southern Blacks, and Northern whites. Washington did not disappoint. In his speech, he seemed to accept an inferior status for Blacks for the present, quote, no race can prosper till it learns that there is as much dignity in telling a field as in writing a poem. It is at the bottom of life we must begin and not at the top. Implying that equal rights had to be earned, Washington seemed to condone segregation, quote, in all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. The speech, soon dubbed the Atlanta Compromise, won great acclaim. Southern whites were pleased to hear a black educator seem to urge his race to accept segregation and disenfranchisement. Northern whites, too, were receptive, to the, or were receptive to the notion that the South would work out its race relations all by itself. Until his death in 1915, Washington was the most prominent Black leader in the nation, at least among white Americans. Among African Americans, Washington's message found a mixed reception. Some accepted his approach as appropriate for the moment. Others criticized him for sacrificing Black rights. Henry M. Turner, Bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Atlanta, declared that Washington, quote, will have to live a long time to undo the harm he has done to our race. Privately, however, Washington never accepted disenfranchisement and segregation as permanent fixtures in Southern life, and he worked to reverse them. In the wider world, South Africa establishes racial separation. As Southern states legislated disenfranchisement and segregation, similar changes occurred in the British colonies and Boer, descendants of Dutch colonists, uh, republics of South Africa. In the British colonies, a law in 1892 limited Black voting and another law in 1894 disenfranchised migrants from India. In 1905, the General Pass Regulations Bill completely disenfranchised Blacks and restricted where they could live and their freedom of movement. In 1910, the British and Boer areas combined in the Union of South Africa. 
New legislation gave whites complete political control over all other racial groups. Subsequent laws limited Black and Indian land ownership and required residential segregation. The American South and South Africa followed diverging paths after World War II, when segregation and disenfranchisement began to break down in the American South, but adoption of apartheid in South Africa brought even more rigid racial separation until 1994. Yes, I said 94, 1994. Even as African Americans debated Washington's Atlanta speech, Southern lawmakers were redefining the legal status of African Americans. State after state followed the lead of Mississippi and disenfranchised Black voters. Louisiana in 1898 added the infamous grandfather clause, specifying that men who failed to meet new requirements to vote could vote if their fathers or if their grandfathers had been eligible to vote in 1867, which of course was before the 14th Amendment extended suffrage to African Americans. Thus, poor or illiterate whites could vote. Methods varied, but each Southern state set up barriers to voting, then carved holes through which only whites could pass. Southern Democrats, who had long defined themselves as the white man's party or the party of white supremacy, also restricted their primaries and conventions to whites only. South Carolina took the step first in 1896, and other states soon followed. Southern lawmakers began to extend segregation by law, especially after the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, involving a Louisiana law requiring segregated railroad cars. When the court ruled that, quote, separate but equal facilities did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, Southern legislatures applied that reasoning elsewhere, requiring segregation of almost everything and especially public spaces, spaces such as parks and restaurants. Violence against African Americans accompanied these new laws, providing an unmistakable lesson in the consequences of resistance. From 1885 to 1900, when the South was redefining relations between the races, the region witnessed more than 2,500 deaths by lynching, about one every two days. The victims were almost all African Americans, and the largest numbers were in the states with the most Black residents. Some African Americans responded by leaving the South and seeking a new life, either in the West or in the growing cities of the Northeast and Midwest. Ethnicity and race in the Gilded Age, considering the questions, how do the expectations of European immigrants differ from their experiences, and compare the experiences of Chinese Americans, American Indians, Mexican Americans, and African Americans in the Gilded Age. By 1900, immigrants made up more than 40% of the population of New York, San Francisco, and Chicago, and more than a third of the population in several other major cities. The United States has always attracted large numbers of immigrants, but never before experienced a flood like that between the Civil War and World War I. Nearly all of these immigrants came from Europe, and many settled in cities. Significant numbers of immigrants also came from Asia, nearly all of whom settled in the West. At the same time, American Indians and Latinos in the Southwest faced new constraints on their choices and opportunities. A flood of immigrants from Europe. The numbers of immigrants varied from year to year, higher in prosperous years, lower in depression years, but the trend was upward. Nearly a quarter of a million arrived in 1865, two thirds of a million in 1881, and a million in 1905. In the 1870s and 1980s, most came from Great Britain, Ireland, Scandinavia, which by the way is the region of Northern Europe consisting of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland. They also came from Germany and, Germany, excuse me, and Canada. But after about 1890, increasing numbers arrived from Southern and Eastern Europe. They, by the way, will be called the new immigrants. New immigrants are Southern and Eastern European. They're after 1890. Remember the older immigrants came from Germany and Ireland, and that's like the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. By 1910, immigrants and their children made up more than 35% of the total population. Figure 17.3 shows the place of birth of the foreign-born population for the census years from 1870 through 1920. Note especially how the foreign-born population became increasingly diverse after 1890. Immigrants left their former homes for a variety of reasons. In Ireland, a fourfold population increase between 1750 and 1850 combined with changes in agriculture to push people off the land. Repeated failure of potato crops after 1845 produced widespread famine and starvation, greatly increasing migration. Similar population pressures elsewhere in Europe, though without famine, produced population movements from rural areas to cities, to other parts of Europe, and to other parts of the world, including Canada, Argentina, and Australia. The United States attracted the largest number and the greatest diversity of European immigrants. Some came because of the reputation of the United States for democracy and toleration of religious differences. Nearly all came because America was the land of opportunity. They came, as one bluntly said, for jobs and, as another declared, for money. In fact, the reasons for immigration to America varied from person to person, country to country, and year to year. Irish immigrants, many desperately poor, arrived in the greatest numbers before the Civil War, but Irish immigration continued at high levels until the 1890s. 
Many Irish settled in the cities of the Northeast, making up a quarter of the population in New York City and Boston as early as 1860. Many immigrants who came in the 1870s and 1880s found that good farmland was available in the North Central states at reasonable prices or even for free under the Homestead Act. One woman recalled that in rural Nebraska in the 1880s, her family could attend Sunday church services in Norwegian, Danish, Swedish, French, Czech, or German, as well as English. Scandinavians, Dutch, Swiss, Czechs, and Germans were most likely to be farmers, but all those groups were also to be found in cities, especially in the Midwest. Map 17.1 shows clearly that immigrant communities were not limited to cities or to industrial areas. Patterns of settlement reflect in part the opportunities immigrants found when they arrived. After 1890, farmland was more difficult to obtain. The 1890s also marked a shift in the sources of immigration, with disproportionately more coming from Southern and Eastern Europe and arriving with little or no capital, meaning not a lot of money. Newcomers after 1890 were more likely to find work in the rapidly expanding industries, especially mining, transportation, and manufacturing, but there were many individual variations on these patterns. Some immigrants coming after 1890 intended to become farmers and succeeded. Many who came before 1890 became industrial workers or took other urban jobs. In the 19th century, most old stock Americans, old stock by the way, meaning those who were born in the US of parents who were born in the US, more generally those Americans, um, several generations removed from immigration. Foreign stock refers to those of foreign birth or of foreign parentage. In the 19th century, most old stock Americans assumed that immigrants should quickly learn English, become citizens, and restructure their lives and values to resemble those of longtime residents. Most immigrants, however, resisted rapid assimilation. Assimilation, by the way, is um, among culturally distinct groups, the process of adopting the behaviors and values of the dominant society and its culture. For the majority, assimilation took place over a lifetime or even over generations. It doesn't happen all at once. Most retain elements of their own cultures even as they embrace their new lives in America. For many, their sense of identity came to reflect where they came from and where they live now. That is, they came to think of themselves as hyphenated Americans, German Americans, Irish Americans, Norwegian Americans. On arriving in America, with its strange language and customs, many immigrants sought others who shared their cultural values, practiced their religion, and especially who spoke their language. Ethnic communities emerged wherever there were large numbers of immigrants. These communities played a significant role in newcomers' transition to America, giving new immigrants a chance to learn about their new home with assistance from those who had already come earlier. At the same time, newcomers could, without apology or embarrassment, retain cultural values and behaviors from their homelands. Foreign language newspapers helped to connect the old country to the new, for they provided news from the old country as well as from other similar communities in the United States. For members of nearly every ethnic group, religious institutions provided important elements of ethnic group identity. Protestant immigration groups created new church organizations based on both the theology and language. Catholic parishes in immigrant neighborhoods often took on the ethnic characteristics of the community, with services in the immigrants' language and special observances transplanted from the old country. Jewish congregations, too, often differed according to the ethnic background of their members. Nativism. Though most immigrants changed their behavior, many old stock Americans, even some only a generation removed from immigrant forebears, expected immigrants to lay aside their previous identities and blend into prevailing cultural patterns. Some old stock Americans fretted over the multiplication of German and Italian newspapers, feared to go into neighborhoods where they had rarely heard an English sentence, and shuddered at the multiplication of Catholic schools. Such fears and misgivings fostered the growth of nativism. Nativism is a really important thing to understand. It's defined as the view that old stock values and social patterns were preferable to those of immigrants. Nativism, nativism excuse me, is basically when you're anti-immigrant. Nativists argued that only their values and institutions were genuinely American, and they feared that immigrants would threaten those traditions. Nativism was often linked to anti-Catholicism. Irish and German immigrant groups and later Italian and Polish groups included large numbers of Catholics and many old stock Americans came to identify the Catholic church as an immigrant church. The American Protective Association, the APA, founded in 1887, loudly procla proclaimed itself the voice of anti-Catholicism. Its members pledged not to hire Catholics, not to vote for Catholics, and not to go on strike with Catholics. A half a million strong by 1894, APA members tried to dominate the Republican Party, and they succeeded in some parts of the Midwest before they died out by the late 1890s. Jews, too, faced religious antagonism. In the 1870s, increasing numbers of organizations and businesses began to discriminate against Jews. Some employers refused to hire Jews. After 1900, such discrimination intensified. Many social organizations barred Jews from membership and restricted, restrictive covenants kept them from buying homes in certain neighborhoods. 
During the 1890s, a diverse political coalition emerged aimed at reducing immigration. Later organizations began to look at immigrants as potential threats to jobs and wage levels. Some employers now connected immigrants with unions and radicalism, and they charged that unions rep represented foreign, un-American influences. Foreign-born radicals and anarchists were a special target, as newspapers claimed that there is no such thing as an American anarchist. In 1901, Leon Cholgos, an American-born anarchist with a foreign-sounding name, assassinated President William McKinley, and Congress promptly passed a bill barring anarchists from immigrating to the United States. During the 1890s, nativism grew as the sources of European immigration shifted from Northwestern Europe to Southern and Eastern Europe, bringing larger numbers of Italians, Poles, and other Slavs, and Eastern European Jews. Anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism combined to create a sense that these new immigrants were less desirable than old immigrants who were morally, uh, more from Northwestern Europe. Those two uh, terms, by the way, new immigrant and old immigrant, they're defined on 451, definitely know that. New immigrants are newcomers from Southern and Eastern Europe who began arriving in the U.S. in significant numbers during 1890s and after. And old immigrants, again, are newcomers from Northern and Western Europe. Um, I'm thinking here Germany, I'm thinking Ireland, who made up much of the immigration to the U.S. before the 1890s. The arrival of many new immigrants after 1890 coincided with a growing tendency to glorify Anglo-Saxons, or ancestors of the English, and accomplishments by the English and English Americans. Proponents of Anglo-Saxonism took alarm from uh, statistics showing old stock Americans having fewer children than immigrants. Some voiced fears of a race suicide in which Anglo-Saxons allowed themselves to be bred out of existence. Some nativists now became blatant racists. By the 1890s, these economic, political, religious, and racist strains converged in demands that the federal government restrict immigration from Europe. Immigrants to the Golden Mountain. The West has long the West has long had greater ethnic diversity than the rest of the nation, as illustrated in figure 17.4. By 1900, the Western half of the United States included more than 80% of all Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and Asian Americans. Between 1854 and 1882, some 300,000 Chinese immigrants entered the United States. Most came from Southern China, which in the 1840s and 1850s suffered from political instability, economic distress, and famine. Among Chinese immigrants who came during the California Gold Rush, a California, California excuse me, became known as Gam San or Gold Mountain. Many Chinese worked in mining or construction, especially Western railroad building. Others worked as agricultural laborers and farmers, notably in California. Some made important contributions to crop development, especially fruit growing. In San Francisco and elsewhere in the West, Chinese immigrants established Chinatowns, relatively, relatively autonomous and largely self-contained Chinese communities. In San Francisco's Chinatown, immigrants formed kinship organizations and distinct associations whose members had come from the same part of China to assist and to protect each other. At confederation of such associations, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, often called the Six Companies, eventually dominated the social and economic life of Chinese communities in much of the West. Some such communities were largely male, partly because immigration officials permitted only a few Chinese women to enter the country, apparently to prevent an American board generation. As was true in many largely male communities, gambling and prostitution flourished, giving Chinatown's reputations as centers for vice. Almost from the beginning, Chinese immigrants encountered discrimination and violence. During the gold rush, a California state tax on foreign-born minors posed a significant burden on Chinese and also Latino gold seekers. During the 1890s, many white workers blamed the Chinese for driving wages down and unemployment up. In fact, different economic factors depressed wage levels and brought unemployment. But white workers seeking a scapegoat instigated anti-Chinese riots in Los Angeles in 1871 and in San Francisco in 1877. In these riots, the message was usually the same, the Chinese must go. In 1882, Congress responded to repeated pressures from Pacific Coast labor organizations by passing the Chinese Exclusion Act, prohibiting entry to all Chinese people except teachers, students, merchants, tourists, and officials. The Chinese Exclusion Act is defined as an act of Congress in 1882, prohibiting Chinese laborers from entering the US and it was extended periodically until World War II. Definitely know the Chinese Exclusion Act, AP loves to ask about that. This was the first significant restriction on immigration. The law reaffirmed that Asian immigrants were not eligible to become naturalized citizens. Soon after, in 1885, anti-Chinese riots swept through much of the West. In Rock Springs, Wyoming Territory, white coal miners burned the Chinatown and killed 28 Chinese. In response, many Chinese retreated to the largest Chinatowns and some even returned to China. In some parts of the West, the Chinese were subjugated, subject, 
subjected, oh my goodness, to segregation similar to that imposed on African Americans in the South, including residential and occupational segregation rooted in local custom rather than law. In 1871, the San Francisco School Board barred Chinese students from that city's public schools. When the courts ordered the city to provide education for Mamie Tape, the school board set up a segregated school for Chinese children. A few other places in the West set up segregated schools for Chinese American children, but school segregation began to break down in the 1910s and 1920s. Like the Tape family, Chinese organizations sometimes fought anti-Chinese legislation through the courts. When in San Francisco law restricted Chinese laundry owners, they brought a court challenge. In Yi Kuo v. Hopkins, 1886, the U.S. Supreme Court for the first time declared a licensing law unconstitutional because local authorities had used it to discriminate on the basis of race. The decision also established that the 14th Amendment applied to immigrants who were not citizens. That's really important. Yi Kuo v. Hopkins does establish that the 14th Amendment applies to immigrants who are not citizens. When other immigrants began to arrive from Asia, they too concentrated in the West. Japanese immigrants started coming in significant numbers after 1890. From 1891 through 1907, nearly 150,000 arrived, most through South Pacific, or excuse me, through Pacific Coast ports. Whites in the West, especially organized labor, viewed Japanese immigrants much as they had earlier immigrants from China, with hostility and scorn. Pushed by Western labor organizations, President Theodore Roosevelt in 1907 negotiated an agreement with Japan to halt immigration of Chinese laborers. To skip back now to a deeper understanding of history on page 452, reconstructing past social patterns. When historians seek to understand the lives of ordinary people in past times, they rarely find memoirs or autobiographies like those discussed in a deeper understanding of history in chapter 16. Few ordinary Americans left such records. Historians have instead used a variety of primary sources to reconstruct the social and economic patterns of past communities. Two valuable sources for that purpose are the manuscript census and the Sanborn insurance maps. For much of American history, the census was taken by people who went door to door, talking to somebody in each household to collect information about the people who lived there. The census takers recorded information on large printed forms. These forms still exist. Historians can review them through 18, 1940. Those after 1940 are closed in order to protect the privacy of living persons. The 1880 manuscript census, the excerpt shown here as part of a larger page, records that the Tate family lived at 1771 Green Street in San Francisco. Their neighbors were all white and mostly born in the US. A few were from Ireland or Germany. Neighboring households included a physician, a railway conductor, a contractor, two carpenters, an engineer, and a lawyer. Joseph Tape's occupation appears as expressman. All the adults in their neighborhood were literate. Only a few families took in boarders. All this information points to this as a middle-class neighborhood with a mix of professionals, small business owners, skilled artisans, and a few blue-collar boarders. The 1900 census records that the Tate family by then was living in a similar neighborhood in Berkeley. This evidence reinforces the conclusion that the Tates were well assimilated, living in white middle-class neighborhoods. The Sanborn insurance maps were made for insurance agents in order to determine how much to charge people for fire insurance. The maps plotted the configuration, construction material, and uses of all properties, identifying potential sources of fire. Historians use the Sanborn maps to reconstruct neighborhoods. The 1885 City Directory provides the address of Joseph's Tapes Express Company as 704 DuPont Street, now Grant Avenue, in the midst of Chinatown. A Sanborn map from a few years later, shown here in part, shows 704 DuPont Street as part of a densely packed area of small stores, shops, small apartments or sleeping rooms, and small factories making shoes, clothing, and cigars. Comparing the Sanborn maps with the census information makes clear that the Tate family lived very different lives than those who lived in Chinatown. Forced assimilation. As headlines about the Great Sioux War, the Nez Pierces, and Geronimo faded from the nation's newspapers, many Americans began to describe American Indians as a vanishing race. But Indian people did not vanish. With the end of armed conflict, relations between Native Americans and the rest of the nation entered a new phase. Well before the end of the Indian Wars, federal policymakers began to implement plans to assimilate Native Americans into white society. They were influenced by leading scholars, notably Lewis Henry Morgan of the Smithsonian Institution, who viewed culture as an evolutionary process. All peoples, these scholars concluded, were evolving toward, quote, higher cultural types. To most white Americans in the late 19th century, Western Europeans and their descendants around the world had already reached the highest levels of development. Modern anthropologists no longer have such an understanding of cultural change, meaning we know better now. Public support for changes in federal policy grew in response to speaking tours by American Indians and white reformers and publication of several exposés, notably Helen Hunt Jackson's A Century of Dishonor and Ramona. In 
federal policymakers now accepted reformers' arguments for speeding up the evolutionary process for Native Americans. Apparently, no reformers or federal policymakers understood that American Indians had complex cultures that were very different from, but not inferior to, the culture of Americans of European descent, and not until the 1890s did Morgan's evolutionary perspective come under challenge, notably from Franz Boas, an anthropologist who held that every culture develops and should be understood on its own, rather than as part of an evolutionary chain. Education was an important element in the reformers' plans for civilizing, quote, the Indians. Federal officials worked with churches and philanthropic organizations to establish schools distant from the reservations, where many Native American children were sent to live and study. Intending to assimilate these students into white society, teachers forbade Indian students to speak their languages, practice their religion, or otherwise follow their own cultural patterns. Other educational programs aimed to train adult Indian men as farmers or mechanics. Federal officials also tried to prohibit some religious observances and traditional practices on reservations. The Dawes Severalty Act, 1887, was an important element in these, quote, civilizing efforts. Definitely know the Dawes Severalty Act. Again, AP loves to ask about that. Its objective was to make the Indians into self-sufficient, property-conscious, profit-oriented individual farmers, model citizens of 19th century white America. The law created a government policy of severalty, that is, individual ownership of the land by Native Americans. Reservations were to be divided into individual family farms of 160 acres. Once each family received its allotment, the government would sell its surplus reservation land and use the proceeds for Indian education. This policy found enthusiastic support among both reformers urging rapid assimilation and Westerners who coveted, meaning they wanted, Indian lands. Individual land ownership, however, violated traditional Native American views that land was for the use of all and that sharing was a major obligation. Although some Indian leaders favored the Dawes Act, others urged Congress to defeat it. Delegates from the Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw nations bluntly told Congress, our people have not asked for or authorized this. Our own laws regulate a system of land tenure suited to our condition. Nonetheless, Congress approved the Dawes Act. The result bore out the warning of Senator Henry Teller of Colorado, who called it a bill to despoil the Indians of their land. Once allotments to Indian families were made, about 70% of the reservation land remained, and much of it was sold, despite the promises in the treaties that had established the reservations. In the end, the, the Dawes Act did not end the reservation system, nor did it reduce the Indians' dependent on the dependence on the federal government. It did, however, separate the Indians from a good deal of their land. Native Americans responded to their situation in various ways. Some tried to cooperate with the assimilation programs. Susan LaFleche, daughter of an Omaha leader, graduated from medical college in 1889 at the head of her class. But she disappointed her teachers, who wanted her to abandon Indian culture when she set up her medical practice near the Omaha Reservation, treated both white and Omaha patients, and took part in tribal affairs and also participated in the local white community through the temperance movement and sometimes by preaching in the local Presbyterian church. There's a picture of her, by the way, on 455. Dr. LaFleche seems to have moved easily between two cultures. Some Native Americans preferred the old ways, keeping their children out of school and secretly practicing traditional religious ceremonies. Native American people's cultural patterns changed, but not always in the way federal officials intended. In Oklahoma, where groups with different traditional cultures lived in proximity, people began to borrow cultural practices from others. In some places, Indians became part of the wage-earning workforce near their reservations, sometimes against the wishes of reservation officials. In the late 19th century, the peyote cult, based on the hallucinogenic properties of the peyote cactus, emerged as an alternative religion. It evolved into the Native American church, combining elements of traditional Indian culture, Christianity, and peyote use. Mexican Americans in the Southwest. The United States annexed Texas in 1845 and soon after acquired vast territories from Mexico at the end of the Mexican American War. Large numbers of people who lived there spoke Spanish, and many were mestizos, meaning that they were of mixed Spanish and Native American ancestry. The treaties by which the United States acquired those territories specified that Mexican citizens living there automatically became American citizens. Throughout the Southwest during the late 19th century, many Mexican Americans lost their land as the region attracted English-speaking whites, often called Anglos, by those whose first language is Spanish. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the war with Mexico, guaranteed Mexican Americans as land holdings, but the vagueness of Spanish and Mexican land grants encouraged legal challenges. Sometimes, Mexican Americans were cheated out of their land through fraud. The California Gold Rush, beginning in 1849, attracted fortune seekers from around the world, most from the Eastern United States and Europe. 100,000 gold seekers inundated the few thousand Mexican American camps in Northern California. People from Latin America who came to California as gold seekers were often driven from the mines by racist harassment and attacks on foreign miners. 
fewer Anglos came to Southern California until late in the 19th century. There, California's one election to local and state office, including Romualda Pacheco, who served as a state treasurer and lieutenant governor and succeeded to the governorship in 1875. By the 1870s, many of the pueblos, or towns created under Mexican or Spanish governments, had become barrios, some rural, some in inner cities. Barrios, by the way, are Spanish-speaking communities often part of a larger city. Like the ethnic neighborhoods created by European immigrants, barrios had mutual benefit societies, political associations, and newspapers published in the language of the community, and the cornerstone of both immigrant neighborhoods and barrios was often a church. There was an important difference, however. European immigrants had come to a new land where they anticipated making changes in their own lives. Barrio residents, in contrast, lived where Mexicans had lived for generations but now found themselves surrounded by English-speaking Americans who hired them for cheap wages, sometimes scorned their culture, and pr pressured them to assimilate. In Texas, as in California, some Tejanos had welcomed a break with Mexico. Lorenzo de Zavala, for example, served as vice president of the Texas Republic. By 1900, though, much of the land in South Texas had passed out of Tejano hands, sometimes legally, sometimes fraudulently, but the new Anglo ranch owners usually maintained the social patterns characteristic of Tejano ranchers. A large section of South Texas remained culturally Mexican, home to Tejanos and two-thirds of all Mexican immigrants who came to the U.S. before 1900. In the 1890s, one journalist described the area as an overlapping of Mexico into the United States. During the 1860s and 1870s, conflicts sometimes broke out as Mexican Americans challenged the political and economic power of Anglo newcomers. In social relations and in politics, all but a few wealthy Tejanos came to be subordinate to the Anglos, who dominated the regional economy and the professions. In New Mexico territory, Hispanos were the majority through the 19th century. They made up a majority of the territorial legislatures and were frequently elected as territorial delegates to Congress, the only territorial position elected by voters. Anglos began to arrive in significant numbers with the first railroad in 1879. Although Hispanos were the majority, many lost their land holdings in ways similar to patterns in California and Texas, except that some who enriched themselves were wealthy Hispanos. Until 1910, the Latino population in the Southwest grew more slowly than the Anglo population. After 1910, that situation reversed as political and social upheavals in Mexico prompted massive migration to the United States. Probably a million people, equivalent to one-tenth of the population of Mexico in 1910, arrived over the next 20 years. More than half stayed in Texas, but significant numbers settled in Southern California and elsewhere in the Southwest. Inevitably, this new stream of immigrants changed some of the patterns of ethnic relations that had characterized the region since the mid-19th century. Workers organized, considering the questions, how did industrialization affect workers in the new industries? And how do the various labor organizations define their membership and purpose? Does this help explain their successes and shortcomings? The rapid expansion of railroads, mining, and manufacturing created a demand for labor to lay the rails, dig the ore, tend the furnaces, and carry out a thousand other tasks. America's new workers, men, women, and children from many ethnic groups, came from across the nation and around the world. Despite hopes for a rags to riches triumph, like Andrew Carnegie's, very few rose from the shop floor to manager's office. Workers for industry. The labor force more than doubled in size between 1870 and 1900. The largest increases occurred in industries undergoing the greatest changes. Agriculture continued to employ the largest share of the labor force, ranging downward from more than half in 1870 to two-fifths in 1900, but the agricultural workforce grew the least, proportionally, of all the major categories of workers. Some new industrial workers came from rural areas. At the same time that mechanization was reducing the number of farm workers needed, farm birth rates remained high. Thus, throughout rural parts of New England and the Middle Atlantic states, many people found it difficult to make a living from agriculture and moved to urban or industrial areas. The expanding economy, however, needed many more workers than the nation itself could supply. The large-scale immigration of the time contributed many adult males to the workforce, especially in mining, manufacturing, and transportation. The expanding economy also pulled women and children into the industrial workforce. A study in 1875 showed that the average male factory worker in Lawrence, Massachusetts earned $500 per year and that the average family in Lawrence required a minimum annual income of $600 to provide sufficient food, clothing, and shelter. Since Lawrence was fairly typical of much of the new industrial economy, this study and others like it indicate why workers' families often required two or more incomes. By 1880, a million children, those under the age of 16, worked for wages, the largest number in agriculture. Children worked in the fields and mills of the South, operated sewing machines in New York, and sorted vegetables in Delaware canneries. Others worked as newsboys, boot blacks, or domestic servants. Still others worked at home alongside their parents who brought home piecework, 
Piecework, by the way, is defined as work for which someone is paid for the number of items turned out rather than by the hour. Most working children turned over their wages to their parents. Such child laborers may have finished only a few years of school. Most women who worked outside the home were unmarried. In 1890, 40% of all single women worked for wages along with 30% of widowed or divorced women. Among married women, only 5% did so. Black women were employed at higher proportions in all categories. Some occupations came to be filled mainly by women. By 1900, females made up more than 70% of the workforce in clothing factories, knitting mills, and other textile operations. Women also dominated certain types of office work. For example, they made up more than 70% of secretaries and typists and 80% of telephone operators. However, as women moved into office work, displacing men, wage levels fell along with the likelihood of promotion from clerical work to managerial status. For women, office work usually paid less than factory work, but it was safer and it had higher status. Women and children workers almost always earned less than their male counterparts. In most industries, work was separated by age and gender, and adult males usually held the more skilled jobs, commanding the best pay. Even when men and women did the same work, they rarely received the same pay, see figure 17.6. This wage differential was often explained by the argument that a man had to support a family, whereas a woman worked to supplement the income of her husband or her father. Some women were self-employed. For example, they made and sold women's hats or dresses. In urban working class neighborhoods, married or widowed women often rented a room to a boarder or charged to do other people's laundry or sewing. In rural areas, married women often kept chickens and sold eggs to supplement their family's income. Because so many of the new industrial workers had been born into a rural society, either in the US or in Europe, they found industrial work quite different from their previous work. Farm families worked from sunrise to sunset, but they did so at their own pace, taking a break when they felt the need and managing their work to avoid exhaustion. Self-employed blacksmiths, carpenters, dressmakers, and other skilled workers also controlled the speed and intensity of their work, although, like the farmer, they might work long hours. Such artisans often considered this autonomy part of the dignity of labor. In many early factories, skilled workers often set the pace of work around them. They also earned more than other workers, and they were difficult to replace. In the 19th century, the workday in more industrial industries averaged 10 or 12 hours, six days a week, six days a week. People expected to work long hours, but found that industrial work controlled them rather than the other way around. In many factories, the speed of the machine set the pace of the work, and the machine speeds were often centrally controlled. If managers ordered a speed up, defined as an effort to make employees produce more goods at the same time or for the same pay, um, if managers ordered a speed up, workers worked faster. 10 or 12 hour days at a constant rapid pace drained the workers. A woman textile worker in 1882 said, I get so exhausted that I can scarcely drag myself home when night comes. The pace of industrial work, together with inadequate safety precautions, contributed to a high rate of accidents, injuries, and deaths. The first thorough study of workplace fatalities was not conducted until 1913, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics found that 23,000 industrial deaths had occurred among a workforce of 38 million, which is equivalent to 61 deaths per 100,000 workers. Today, with state and federal safety regulations, there are about four deaths per 100,000 workers. Injuries and disabilities were even more numerous. Those disabled by industrial accidents received no benefits from the federal government, and they rarely received anything from state or local governments or from their employers. Many businesses considered an on-the-job injury to be due to carelessness by the employee and grounds for actually firing them. Despite rags to riches success stories, extreme mobility was highly unusual. Nearly all successful business leaders, in fact, came from middle or upper class families. Few workers moved more than a step or so up the economic ladder. An unskilled laborer might become a semi-skilled worker or a skilled worker might become a foreman, but few wage earners moved into the middle class. If they did, it was usually as the owner of a small and often struggling business. Nonetheless, for skilled workers who were steadily employed, the declining consumer prices after the Civil War meant that their wages had somewhat greater purchasing power, even though wages may have declined in actual dollars. For example, the average blacksmith saw a decline in daily wages from 250 in 1865 to 231 in 1880, but because the decline in prices for consumer goods was greater, 231 in 1880 had the same purchasing power as 366 would have had in 1865. Thus, a blacksmith's family was somewhat better off, despite the lower wages, and may have been able to purchase some of the new consumer goods. However, for industrial wage earners, increased uh, purchasing power was often offset by periodic unemployment or reduced hours during times of economic contraction. Think back to those periods of boom and bust that we talked about last chapter. The origins of unions and labor conflict in the 1870s. Just as the entrepreneurs of the late 19th century faced choices between competition and cooperation, so too did their employees. 
Some workers reacted to the far-reaching changes in the nature of work by joining with other workers in efforts to maintain or to regain control over their working conditions. Skilled workers remained indispensable in many fields. Only a skilled iron molder could set up the molds and know exactly when and how to pour molten iron into them. Only an experienced carpenter could build stairs or could hang doors properly. Only a skilled typesetter could quickly transform handwritten copy lines into lines of lead type. Such workers took pride in the quality of their work and knew that their skill was crucial to their employer's success. One union leader was referring to such workers when he said, the manager's brains are under the workman's cap. Skilled workers formed the first unions, called craft unions or trade unions, because membership was limited to skilled workers in a particular craft or trade. Before the Civil War, workers in most American cities created local trade unions in an attempt to regulate the quality of work, wages, hours, and working conditions within their craft. Such unions often limited their membership not just to workers with particular skills, but also to white males with those skills. Local unions eventually formed national trade organizations, 26 by 1873, 39 by 1880. They sometimes called themselves brotherhoods. For example, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners formed in 1881, and they drew on their craft traditions to forge bonds of unity. The skills that defined craft union membership also provided the basis for their success. Skills that sometimes took years to develop made craft workers difficult to replace. If most craft workers within a city belonged to the local union, a strike could badly disrupt or shut down the affected businesses. The strike, therefore, was a powerful weapon for skilled workers. Strikes most often succeeded in times of prosperity, when employers wanted to continue operating and when they were financially able to make concessions to workers. When the economy turned down and employers reduced work hours or laid off workers, craft unions sometimes disintegrated because they could not use the strike effectively. Only after the 1880s did local and national unions develop strategies that permitted them to survive depressions. Unskilled or semi-skilled workers, the majority of many emerging industries, lacked the skills that gave the craft unions their bargaining power. Without such skills, they could be replaced easily if they chose to strike. The most effective and successful unions, therefore, consisted of skilled workers, sometimes called the aristocracy of labor. Shortly after the Civil War in 1866, craft unionists representing a variety of local and national organizations joined with reformers to create the National Labor Union, or the NLU, headed by William Silvis of the Iron Molders until he died in 1869. The NLU also included representatives of women's organizations and, after vigorous debate, decided to encourage the organization of Black workers, too. The NLU's most important objective was to establish eight hours as the proper length for a day's work. In 1870, the NLU divided itself into a labor organization and a political party, the National Labor Reform Party. In 1872, that party nominated candidates for president and vice president, but the campaign was so unsuccessful and divisive that neither the NLU nor the party ever met again. In 1877, for the first time, the nation witnessed widespread labor strife. After the onset of depression in 1873, railroad companies reduced costs by repeatedly cutting wages. Railroad workers' pay fell by more than a third from 1873 to 1877. Union leaders talked about striking, but they failed to act. And when companies announced additional pay cuts, railway workers took matters into their own hands. On July 16, 1877, firemen and brakemen on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the B&O, stopped work in Maryland. The next day in West Virginia, railway workers refused to work until the company restored their wages. Members of the local community supported the strikers. The governor of West Virginia sent in the state militia, but strikers still prevented the trains from moving. The governor then requested federal troops and President Rutherford B. Hayes sent them. Federal troops restored service on the Baltimore and Ohio, but the strike spread to other lines. Strikers shut down trains in Pittsburgh. The local militia refused to act against the strikers, so the governor of Pennsylvania sent militia units from Philadelphia. When the militia killed 26 people, strikers and their sympathizers fought back, forced the troops to retreat, and burned and looted railroad property throughout Pittsburgh. Strikes erupted across Pennsylvania and New York and throughout the Midwest. Strikers everywhere drew support from their local communities. In various places, coal miners, factory workers, small business owners, farmers, black workers, and women demonstrated their solidarity with the railroad workers. Unions in St. Louis declared a general strike to secure the eight-hour workday and to end child labor. Eventually, state militia, federal troops, and local police broke up the strikes. By the strikes' end, dozens of people had lost their lives and damage to railroad property reached $10 million, half of the loss losses taking place in Pittsburgh. The Great Railway Strike of 1877 revealed widespread dislike for the railroad companies and significant community support for strikers. However, the strike alarmed many other Americans. 
Some, some considered the use of troops only a temporary expedient and, like President Hayes, hoped for, quote, education of the strikers, judicious control of the capitalists, and some way to remove the distress which afflicts laborers. Others saw the strike, saw in the strike a forecast of future labor unrest, and they called for better means to enforce law and order. Competing labor organizations in the 1880s. The Great Railway Strike of 1877 suggested that working people could unite across lines of occupation, race, and gender, but no organization drew on that post potential until the early 1880s, when the Knights of Labor emerged as an alternative to craft unions. Definitely know the Knights of Labor. The Knights grew out of an organization of Philadelphia garment workers that was formed in 1869. Abandoning their craft union origins, they proclaimed that labor was the only creator of values or capital, and they recruited members from what they considered the producing class, those who, by their labor, produced value. Anybody who joined the Knights was required to have worked for wages at some time, but the organization specifically excluded only professional gamblers, stockbrokers, lawyers, bankers, and liquor dealers. The Knights accepted African Americans as members, and some 60,000 joined by 1886. The Knights also opened their ranks to women and enrolled about 50,000 by 1886. Some women and African Americans held local and regional leadership positions, and the Knights briefly appointed a woman as a national organizer. Through their activities, the Knights provided both women and African Americans with experience in organizing. Terence V. Powderly, a machinist, led the Knights from 1879 to 1893. Under his leadership, they focused on organization, education, and cooperation as their chief objectives. The Knights favored political action to accomplish such labor reforms as health and safety regulations, the eight hour workday, prohibition of child labor, equal pay for equal work regardless of gender, and the graduated income tax. They also endorsed government ownership of the telephone, telegraph, and railroad systems. In 1878, 1880, and 1882, Powderly won election as mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania as the candidate of a labor party. Local labor parties often appeared in other cities where the Knights were strong. A major objective of the Knights was to secure to the workers the full enjoyment of the wealth they create. To this end, in 1878, they committed themselves to promoting producers and consumers cooperatives, which they hoped would supersede the wage system. A cooperative, by the way, is a business enterprise in which workers and consumers share in ownership and take part in management. Some 135 cooperatives were established by the mid-1880s, but few lasted very long. Most failed because of lack of capital, opposition from rival businesses, or poor organization. Before problems developed within their cooperatives, however, the Knights became the largest labor organization in the country, expanding from 9,000 members in 1879 to 703,000 in 1886. This meteoric growth suggested that many working people were seeking ways to challenge emerging corporate power or to regain control over their own working lives. So in summation, the Knights of Labor is pretty inclusive, meaning they will welcome um, people of many different ethnicities and many different genders, although I do believe that they exclude Chinese and Chinese Americans. And they also include skilled and unskilled workers. Those are two really important things to note because that will set them apart from another really big union who you're about to learn about. Despite the rise of the Knights of Labor, labor organizations soon found themselves divided and on the defensive. On May 1st, 1886, some 80,000 unionists and radicals marched through Chicago streets in support of an eight hour workday. Three days later, Chicago police killed several strikers at the McCormick Harvester Works. Hoping to build on the May Day unity, a group of anarchists called a protest meeting at Haymarket Square. When police tried to break up the rally, someone threw a bomb at the officers. The police then opened fire on the crowd and some protesters fired back. Eight policemen died along with an unknown number of demonstrators and hundred people suffered injuries. The Haymarket bombing sparked public anxiety and anti-union feelings. Employers who had previously opposed unions now tried to discredit them by playing on fears of terrorism. Some people who had supported union goals of better wages and working conditions now shrank back in horror. In Chicago, amid widespread furor over the violence, eight leading anarchists stood trial for inciting the bombing and, on flimsy evidence, they were convicted. I want to note here, they were not convicted because they threw the bombs, but they were convicted because they created an atmosphere in which somebody else felt that it was okay to throw a bomb. Of these eight people who were convicted, four were hanged, one committed suicide, and three remained jailed until a sympathetic governor, John Peter Atgeld, released them in 1893. Two weeks after the Haymarket bombing, trade union leaders met to discuss the inroads that the Knights of Labor were making among their members. They proposed an agreement with the Knights. Trade unions would recruit skilled workers and the Knights would organize only unskilled workers. The Knights refused, so the trade unions organized the American Federation of Labor or the AFL. Membership in the AFL was limited to national trade unions. 
the combined membership of the 13 founding unions amounted to about 140,000, only about one fifth of the number claimed by the Knights at the time. Here is that second union that I referenced earlier, the AFL. Samuel Gompers became the AFL's first president. Born in London in 1850 to Dutch Jewish parents, he learned the cigar makers trade before coming to the US in 1863. He joined the Cigar Makers Union and became its president in 1877. Except for one year, Gompers continued as president of the AFL until his death in 1924. As AFL president, Gompers opposed labor involvement with radicalism or politics, and he favored pure and simple unionism. Higher wages, shorter hours, and improved working conditions for union members achieved not through politics, but through the power of their organizations in relation to their employers. The most AFL unions did not challenge capitalism. They repeatedly used strikes and sometimes engaged in long and bitter struggles with employers. After the 1880s, the AFL suffered little competition from the Knights of Labor. The decline of the Knights had come swiftly. 703,000 members in 1886, down to 260,000 in 1888, and down to 100,000 by 1890. The failure of several strikes involving the Knights in the late 1880s cost them many supporters. That, and they were sort of tarred with the same brush as um, or with what had happened at Haymarket Square. They were sort of put in the same basket as anarchists. And of course, nobody likes anarchists at this point in time. So the Knights are also gonna decline in popularity for that reason. Some who left the Knights were probably disappointed that the cooperative Commonwealth had failed to materialize. Some units of the Knights were organized like trade unions and these groups often preferred the more kindred AFL. The United Mine Workers of America switched from the Knights to the AFL in 1890, but retained some central principles of the Knights, including commitment to include both whites and African-Americans, and to organize all workers in coal mining, not just the most skilled. So to summarize the AFL real fast, the AFL does tend to be pretty exclusive. They really only accept male members, um, and, they also, um, uh, and they also will tend to, um, they'll only include skilled workers, sorry. Labor on the defensive in the 1890s. In the 1890s, workers often found that even the strongest unions could not withstand the power of the new industrial titans. A major demonstration of this power came in 1892 in Homestead, Pennsylvania at the great Carnegie Steel Plant managed by Henry Clay Frick, Carnegie's partner. The union there had a contract with Carnegie Steel. When Frick proposed major wage cuts and the union balked, Frick locked out the union members and prepared to bring in replacements. Frick hired the Pinkerton National Detective Agency to protect strike breakers. 300 armed Pinkertons arrived by riverboat, but 10,000 strikers and community supporters resisted when the private army tried to land. Shots rang out. In the ensuing battle, seven Pinkertons and nine strikers were killed and 60 people were injured. The Pinkertons ended up surrendering, leaving the strikers in control. The governor of Pennsylvania then sent in the state militia who patrolled the city and successfully protected the strike breakers. The union never recovered. This crushing defeat suggested that no union could stand up to America's industrial giants, especially when they could call on the government for assistance. And the government is a friend to corporations and a friend to businesses, um, really throughout the Gilded Age. A similar fate befell the most ambitious new union of the 1890s. In 1893, under the leadership of Eugene V. Debs, railway workers launched the American Railway Union, or the ARU. Previously, railway workers had organized separate unions for engineers, locomotive firemen, switchmen, and conductors, but Debs, a former officer of the firemen's union, hoped to bring all railway workers, skilled and unskilled, together into one union, thereby creating an industrial union. Industrial unions, by the way, are unions that include all of the workers, both skilled or unskilled, in a particular industry. Success came quickly. Within a year, the ARU claimed 150,000 members, making it the largest single union in the nation. The 24 railway companies whose lines entered Chicago had formed the General Managers Association, or the GMA, to address common problems. Alarmed at the rise of the ARU, they found an opportunity to challenge the new union in 1894. Striking workers at the Pullman Palace Car Company, which manufactured luxury railway cars, asked the ARU to boycott Pullman cars, to disconnect them from trains, and to proceed without them. When the ARU agreed, the GMA promised to fire any worker who observed the boycott. Their real purpose, as expressed by the GMA chairman, was to eliminate the ARU and to, quote, wipe him, referring to Debs, out. Within a short time, all ARU members were on strike. Rail traffic in and out of Chicago ground to a halt, affecting railways from the Pacific Coast to New York. U.S. Attorney General Richard Olney, a former railroad lawyer, obtained an injunction against the strikers on the grounds that the strike prevented delivery of the mail and violated the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is discussed in the next chapter. Injunctions, by the way, are court orders requiring an individual or a group to do something or to refrain from doing something. <laughs>
President Grover Cleveland, Cleveland assigned thousands of US marshals and federal troops to protect trains operated by strike breakers. In response, mobs attacked railroad property, especially in Chicago, burning trains and buildings. ARU leaders condemned the violence, but a dozen people died before the strike finally ended. Union leaders, including Debs, were jailed and the ARU was destroyed. This will not be the last time that we see Eugene Debs or see him go to jail. The depression that began in 1893 further weakened the unions. In 1894, Gompers acknowledged that nearly all AFL affiliates had their resources greatly diminished and their efforts largely crippled the, through lost strikes and unemployment. Nevertheless, the AFL hung on. By 1897, the organization claimed 58 national unions with a combined membership of nearly 270,000. Individual Voices, Mary Tate challenges the San Francisco Board of Education. In this letter published in the Alta California, a San Francisco newspaper on April 16, 1885, Mary Tate challenges the decision of the school board to deny her daughter, Mamie, the right to attend the public school in her neighborhood and require her instead to travel a long distance to attend a new segregated school created just for Chinese American children. The letter has been edited and slightly rearranged here. I see that you are going to make all sorts of excuses to keep my child out of the public schools. Dear sirs, will you please tell me, is it a disgrace to be born a Chinese? Didn't God make us all? What right have you to bar my child out of that school because she is of Chinese descent? There is no other worldly reason that you could keep her out except that. I suppose you all go to churches on Sundays. Do you call that a Christian act to compel my little children to go so far to a school that is made on purpose for them? My children don't dress like the other Chinese. They look just as funny amongst them as the Chinese dressed in Chinese clothes look amongst you Caucasians. Mamie's playmates are all Caucasians ever since she could toddle around. If she is good enough to play with them, then is she not good enough to be in the same room and study with them? You had better come and see for yourselves. See if the tapes are not the same as other Caucasians except in features. It seems no matter how a Chinese may live and dress, so long as you know they are Chinese, then they are hated as one. There is not any right or justice for them. I will let the world see, sir, what justice there is when it is governed by the race prejudiced men. Just because she is descended of Chinese parents that is going to prevent her being educated. I guess she is of more, I guess she is more of an American than a good many of you. Summary. In the Gilded Age, as industrialization transformed the economy, immigration and urbanization challenged many established social patterns. As rural Americans and European Americans sought better lives in the cities, urban America changed dramatically. New technologies in construction, transportation, and communication produced a new urban geography with residential neighborhoods defined by economic status. Urban growth brought a new urban middle class. Education underwent far-reaching changes. Socially defined gender roles began to change as some women chose professional careers and took active roles in reform. Urbanization offered new choices to gay men and lesbians by making possible the development of distinctive urban subcultures. The South shared in some of the changes of the Gilded Age, but lagged in others, notably education. The myths of the Old South and the lost cause obscured for some Southerners the real source of their difficulties. Changes in state laws disenfranchised Black voters and other new laws legalized and extended racial segregation. Many Europeans immigrated to the United States because of difficult conditions in their homelands and their expectations of better opportunities in America, push and pull factors. Immigrants often formed distinct communities, often centered at a church. The flood of immigrants spawned nativist reactions among some old stock Americans. Again, nativism is anti-immigration sentiment or anti-immigrant sentiment. The West included immigrants from Asia, American Indians, and Latino peoples in substantial numbers. White Westerners used politics and sometimes violence to exclude and segregate Asian immigrants. Federal policy toward American Indians proceeded from the expectation that they could and should be rapidly assimilated, but such policies largely failed. Latinos, descendants of those living in the Southwest before it became part of the United States, and those who came later from Mexico or elsewhere in Latin America, often found their lives and culture under challenge. Industrial workers had little control over the pace or hours of their work and often faced difficult or dangerous working conditions. Even so, people in both the United States and other parts of the world chose to migrate to expanding industrial centers from rural areas. The new workforce included not only adult males, but also women and children. Some workers formed labor organizations to seek higher wages, shorter hours, and better conditions. Trade unions based on skills were the earliest and most successful organizations. The Great Railway Strike of 1877 was the first indication of what industrial strife could do to the new transportation network based on railroads. Public officials resorted to federal troops to suppress the strike. Espousing cooperatives and reform, the Knights of Labor opened its membership to the unskilled, to African Americans, and to women, groups usually not admitted to trade unions. The Knights died out after 1890. The American Federation of Labor, formed by trade unions, rejected radicalism and sought to work within capitalism to improve wages, hours, and conditions for its women, or excuse me, for its members, who were overwhelmingly white males. Organized labor suffered dramatic defeats in the 1890s at the Homestead Steel Plant and all over the Pullman uh, car boycott. <laughs>